Today, in our first talk, we will speak about Buddhism as the art of living. <clears throat> you all know what the word art means. <clears throat> it means something which is graceful, beautiful, skillful, <clears throat> expert, something that can be done with great skill and ease. Art, though, is seldom applied to Buddhism or to Buddhism as itself. People like to talk about, when they talk about Buddhist art, they're talking about material objects. They never apply the word art to Buddhism itself. But if we really want to speak of Buddhist art, we must, be, we must talk about Buddhism itself. That is the real art. For example, please don't consider that Buddha images are art, are Buddhist art, that those statues that the physical statue is Buddhist art. Rather, take the meaning that is expressed on the face of those images. The meaning expressed in the face, the qualities of joy, of intelligence, of love, of patience, and so on this meaning expressed in the face of the Buddha image. This is the Buddhist art, not the physical statue itself. When we talk about life <clears throat> or living, we should think of this on the highest level, what we can call the supreme life, the highest life. And on this highest level, the, the qualities or things we are looking for can be spoken of in two aspects. The first aspect is calmness, peacefulness. And the second is usefulness, a life that is peaceful and useful. Another thing to consider about life is that it is something which can be developed. Even if you believe that life was given to you by God, nonetheless that life can be developed and should be developed until reaching the point that can be called supreme life. The word supreme in itself signifies something which is above everything. And so this once the supreme life then is inherently above all suffering, all dukkha, all problems. It's above all the undesirable things, all the kind of things that can bother us or upset us all the things that we're having trouble with, all our problems. The supreme life is above all of this. And so you can also call it the excellent life or the sublime life, whichever you like. Next, when we are speaking about Buddhism and trying to speak in line with Buddhist principles, then we need to know what the basic essence or the fundamental essence of Buddhism is. This is what we must consider next. The easiest, most straightforward way to express this fundamental principle of Buddhism is that in Buddhism there is no self. 
there is no atta, self or soul. But actually to put it properly is to say that everything is not self. All things are anatta, which means not self. This is the basic fundamental principle of Buddhism. Everything is not self. Now when things are not self, when they are natural, existing naturally from nature, in nature, through nature, for nature, then things are not graspable. When things are not self, they cannot be clung to or attached to. They don't, when things are not self, they don't have any essence or substance within them that can be grasped at, clung to, or attached to. So the the implication of this essence of Buddhism is that things that are not self are not, cannot be attached to and are not worth attaching to. The religious culture of India developed to its highest stage um, before the Buddhist time to the understanding that there is an Atman in all living things, especially human beings, and that this Atman transmigrates from body to body, becoming more and more purified until eventually it unites with the with Brahma or the Paramatman, and that there is <coughs> And then this Atman or self or soul then exists eternally. So the highest religious understanding of India at that time was that there is an eternal soul or self called an Atman in Sanskrit. Then Buddhism appeared, the wisdom of the Buddha which saw that even this thing is not self. It's just something natural. It's not, it can't be considered truly to be a self or a soul. And so then the Hindu tradition, we can say, to simplify matters, teaches an eternal self. Whereas Buddhism teaches eternal voidness. When there is no self, there is voidness, voidness of self. And the teaching of Buddhism is eternal voidness. Now this thing called self or this, or the feeling that there is a self or we are a self. This is the base, basis for attachment. As soon as we feel there is a self, that we are a self, I am a self, we attach to that. And this is the source of all our problems in, in the world. But when the understanding arises that in fact all things are not self, then one sees that this sense of self should not be attached to and that there is all the things that we, we tend to grasp at and cling to as me and mine, that none of these are worth clinging to and attaching to. And then we see that we should let go of these things. 
And right here is the art of Buddhist living or the Buddhist art of living in being able to not attach to anything, in having the ability to be totally non-attached, where one doesn't even have an impulse to attach to anything. This is the Buddhist art of living. When one sees that everything, that life itself and things in the world around us are not worth, that they cannot be attached to, that there's nothing there to attach to, to cling to as being me or mine, then this is the art of living. Whereas other religions and teachings will cling to something as being self, whether it may be some instinctual feeling that is taken to be the self, or it can be some something that has been taught later. The Buddhist art of living is to not cling to even these things. Buddhism kind of has the character of having come after the rest of them. All the various religions <clears throat> teach some form of self that should be attached to. They may even teach or they may teach a god that should be attached to. Buddhism came after all these kind of teachings and said that there's nothing worth attaching to. There's nothing that can be clung to. So this is why it, it seems to have come after. Because after all the different possible religious teachings appeared, then there appeared the final teaching, which is nothing is worth clinging to as I or mine. It's clear that Buddhism <clears throat> is the first teaching of anatta. It's the first time that anyone taught that the teaching of not-self. Before Buddhism, there were teachers who taught nothing, who taught nihilism, that there is nothing, that there is just some great emptiness or nothingness. This was an older teaching. But Buddhism, the Buddha realized that this was just one extreme viewpoint, that of nothingness, that nothing exists. On the other extreme is the belief in selves, selves that exist constantly, always eternally. But Buddhism realized that both of these, nothingness and total selfness, that these are extreme views which don't fit with the nature of things. That thing or those things that people were taking to be a, a self, an eternal self or soul, Buddhism points out that that self is not self. That self you consider yourself to be, you that self you feel you are, is not self. So Buddhism is neither this a teaching of nihilism or nothingness, which is called nirata, nirata nor is it the teaching of some self that exists on and on from moment to moment, from minute to minute, from life to life. Buddhism is the, which is called Atta, Atta, 
the teaching of self. Buddhism is the teaching of anatta, not self. All the things that exist, exist as not self. They are not self. <clears throat> Something very subtle and important to understand about this atta or self is that all living things have an instinct of self. All living things have some very basic instinctual feeling of being some kind of self. This is true even of plants. It's true of all animals and especially of human beings. For life to establish itself and survive, it needs to identify itself in order to protect itself and serve its needs. This is an instinctual mechanism. It's not one that has to be trained or thought about. It's totally instinctual. So we call it the instinct of Atta or the Atta instinct, the instinct of self. But in the human being, this instinct is conceptualized. We name it, me, I. And then we give a lot of importance to this I, this me. We don't realize that this me, this I, is merely a concept, a label applied to an instinct. Now, the instinct of self doesn't mean that there is a self. It's just this natural occurring, naturally occurring feeling or sense that we have. It doesn't mean that there actually is something that is a self. But we feel that there is, and then we conceptualize it as I, as me. And all of our languages are full of such words. And once we form the concept of me, then the mind goes a little further and conceptualizes mine. And once the mind is thinking in terms of me and mine, then it starts to think about all kinds of things, positive, negative, what I like, what I don't like. And then the mind continues in this way until it gets into suffering, until there is dukkha. This all arises out of this basic instinct of self. But what we don't realize is that we need to, we can just leave it as this, this vague sense of self. There's no need to conceptualize it and let this conception be the center of our thinking. If we can just leave it be at this natural sense of self, and not add it any further into positive to me and mine, positive and negative, then there won't be any, any dukkha, any suffering. Now, all of you know that a concept is not the thing itself. The concept or name of something isn't the thing in itself. So one can see that this, in this instinct of self, there might be a belief or a sense, some feeling that there's a self without there having to be a self in there. The situation is that this instinctual knowledge of self the Thai word for instinct means a knowledge you're born with, an inborn knowledge. 
But instincts are a kind of knowing which is not complete which is still somewhat ignorant and they can even be wrong just because we're born with certain feelings or instincts or knowledge kind of knowing doesn't mean that they're correct that they're actually true and so because this basic concept of self is based in in ignorance it lacks wisdom to take it as the basis for our thinking to center our life on this concept of of me and then it's and then mine and all the other things is also ignorant foolish and this is why it leads to to so many problems into so much suffering but then we are slaves to this concept of i just all the time although this concept is an illu- is illusion although it is delusive although it's just a kind of trickery we are enslaved to it all of our thinking and therefore all of our living is under is under the service is in service of this concept of self and so the buddhist art of living is to get free of this concept to remove life from the tyranny of self to live without being dominated by me and mine this is the buddhist art of living we are the we which is not a real we we are the we we are a, a we that is not a real we or you are a you which is not a real you if you can understand the sentence then you won't be able to understand buddhism once you understand buddhism however you will understand that i am an i which is not a real i when we understand in this way then we are free liberated there are no problems there's nothing heavy in life we have a great need to understand this fact if we don't understand it then we will carry many heavy burdens once there is i there becomes mine we cling to many things as being mine and then we carry them around with us we carry these things in the mind and in the mind they are very heavy and the more the mind the mind is full of me and mine the heavier things get and these burdens are called dukkha suffering this is why we need so so much to understand that that all things are not self so that we no longer need cling to them as me and mine and then we need to carry them around with us we need and have these burdens upon our minds and then we are free liberated now we should look at the loneliness and harmfulness of this self 
of this I. First, when there is this clinging to I, things are picked up and they become very heavy. And so then this I, this life itself, which is clung to as being me, this life bites its owner. It becomes heavy and burdensome to itself. So we say that it bites its owner. But this me doesn't stop with just life right here. It reaches outward and becomes selfishness. And so that life doesn't just bite itself, it bites others. This is the lowliness, the harmfulness of me and mine. It bites itself, it bites its owner, and it bites others. And you can see this very clearly in the modern world, which is which is filled with all different forms of selfishness. You can see how the selfish behavior of people bites themselves, causes themselves great pain and suffering. And you can see how that selfishness reaches outward and bites the lives of others. This is the great harm that's done by me and mine. Please study these things very carefully. Please study this until you see the truth that this world is being destroyed by selfishness. Because of the selfishness of individuals, the world is being ruined. You can see it in the capitalists are selfish. Labor is selfish. The owners are selfish. The employees are selfish. The left is selfish. The right is selfish. The men are selfish. The women are selfish. And so on. All over the place, People are thinking, speaking, and acting selfishly. And the result is that this selfishness is destroying the, the planet. If we're not able to do something about this selfishness, then people will just continue to fight each other. And this fighting will go on until there's nothing left. Industry, material development, and these things which are so highly honored these days, as these increase, selfishness also increases. As industry grows, such as in countries in Thailand, Selfishness increases very rapidly. One can see it happening from year to year. As material standards of living increase, selfishness increases. As selfishness increases, whether in the West or the East, love disappears. Kindness, sharing, and other values like this fade away. And so with material development and industry on the upswing, selfishness grows accordingly. And this leads the world to destruction. All the most serious and terrible problems we have in the world now, all the major crises are caused by selfishness. For example, environmental destruction. We're harming nature far too much. 
killing animals, destroying forests, and all of this is because of selfishness, because of the desire and greed of human beings. Pollution, the vast majority of pollution is unnecessary. It's caused by human greed and carelessness which come from selfishness. The strange new diseases we have now, such as AIDS, these are a a result of selfishness, or at least the crisis is a result of selfishness. Um, Problems of drug abuse, crime, and all the others are because of selfishness. Another most important, maybe the most important danger of this selfishness is because when there is selfishness we can't talk to each other. When we are being selfish we can't talk. We don't listen to each other. We don't care about each other. You can see this in the United Nations. There's so much selfishness that people can't really talk. There's, there's no understanding, just a lot of competition. When they agree, they just agree for selfish reasons. There's no real understanding of each other or even of the world's problems. And if we can't talk to, to each other, we can't sit down and learn to understand each other. How are we going to make this a a world fit to live in? So it begins with this basic instinct of self, and then the concept me, and then mine, and then this grows into selfishness, which bites its owner and bites the rest of the world. This is the source of all our problems. When they are selfish, wives and husbands can't even talk to each other. When they are being selfish, all they do is argue and fight. And eventually they end up getting a divorce because of their selfishness. All the divorces, the high rate of divorce is because Husbands and wives are no longer able to talk together, to understand each other. And this is because of selfishness. But when there isn't any selfishness, it's easy for the entire family to understand each other. It's easy for a village to understand each other and work together. If there isn't any selfishness, It's easy for the whole world to understand each other. Now the terrible problems exist. There are, even between parents and children, there's talking without understanding. Between between teachers and students, there's talk, but no mutual understanding. But if we took out the selfishness, if we just remove the egoism, then everyone could understand each other. Next we'll look at the way of removing selfishness. In Buddhism the way is to, to look at life, to look at oneself, and to see that one is not self. To look and see that one's self is not self. Seeing that and see that everything is not self. Seeing that there's no self to be selfish about, selfishness ends. This is the simple and direct approach of Buddhism. In the religions or for the people who believe 
in God. If you have a God, if there is some God, then the way to unself there is still the need to unselfishness. And the, the way is to give one's life to God, to surrender to the will of God, to do God's will. And one, when one totally gives oneself to God, there is no more room for selfishness when one's life belongs totally to God. There is no more selfishness. This is the other approach. In both kinds of religion, there is the need to overcome selfishness. There's one short sentence that we'd like you to remember. It's the heart of today's talk. The sentence that whenever there is selfishness in life, that life bites its owner. Whenever there is selfishness in life, that life bites its owner. This is what we'd like to talk about in more detail. Dogs hardly ever bite their owners. It's only a really lousy dog that bites its owner. But how often does selfishness bite its owner? Bites its owner over and over again. Your selfishness is far worse than your dog. Please take a good look at this. Please allow us some time to, to provide some examples <clears throat> of how selfishness bites its owner. We will list a certain amount, but there won't be too many. The first, is, the first example is love. Ordinary love bites its owner. Now there's another kind of love, or what in Buddhism is called metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion. That doesn't bite its owner, but ordinary love bites both the lover and the beloved. It's wrong, it's, I'm sorry, it's hot, and burns up both the lover and the object of love. The first example is love. The second example is anger. When anger appears, it bites its owner first before it even has a chance to go and bite anyone else. As soon as anger happens, it's biting its owner. Even though the person we're angry at does, may not even, they may not know a thing. They may not be affected at all. So anger is the second thing that bites its owner. The next example is hatred. As soon as hatred appears, it bites its owner. The one hated may not know a thing. The, they may have no clue that there is any, someone hates them. But the one who has the hate is being bit all the time. This is the third example. The next is fear. Fear is, is foolish, it's stupid, it's unnecessary. Things happen and we get frightened and then we think about it and get even more afraid. And then this fear bites us. Although it's totally unnecessary, there's no need to be afraid. But now the world, in this world, we're afraid of so many things. And so fear bites its owner. The next one is excitement, stimulation. This is one that all of you like very much. You spend a lot of money trying to buy this one, even though it's biting you. Think of all the things we buy to give us excitement and stimulation traveling all around the world, spending 
hundreds, thousands of dollars or whatever in order to find stimulation, excitement, inspiration. People go to sporting events, movies, dancing, spending lots of money on these things just to get excitement. Although all of this excitement fights its owner, it doesn't bring anyone peace, it doesn't help anyone. The tourist industry has become a very important phenomena in the modern world. In some countries, it's a major source of income, where whole countries dedicate themselves to attracting and distracting tourists, trying to be exciting, stimulating, exotic, and so on, in order to deceive people and and get their money. But people like this very much. They foolishly think that this excitement and stimulation is, is happy. And so people are very willing to spend lots of money in order to deceive themselves. And so things, this, this tourist industry has changed the world greatly. It's very hard to find a quiet place anymore because everybody's looking for excitement. They only look for quiet when they're worn out. Please examine this carefully and see if, there's, if this is what's actually happening or not. Pay attention to excitement and stimulation, to inspiration, and see how it fights its owner. People like to search for strange and exotic things. They like to have strange experiences to buy strange things. Even if these things don't have any value, they don't care whether the things are valuable or beneficial. They care only that it's strange and exciting. So, for example, now people Foreigners like to come to Thailand and buy bird cages. Southern Thailand is, likes to keep songbirds and they make very nice cages. And foreigners come and spend a lot of money to buy these cages just because they're different, because they're strange. Sometimes they take them home and just kind of hang them on the wall or occasionally make a light or a lampshade out of it or something. But they buy things for no other purpose than their strangeness, their uniqueness, or whatever. Or some recent news in Thailand is the foreigners are now, they like to eat somtam, which never happened before because it's, it's, it's raw papaya. And if it's made properly, it's mixed with um, raw fermented crab with worms in it and lots of chili pepper. And no, so f foreigners never used to eat that stuff. But now, because they're so crazy about excitement, they'll eat anything just to eat something new. So this strangeness and excitement bites its owner. Please take a good look at this one and be careful. Some other examples are that selfishness makes us, to, makes us worry about the future. Because of selfishness, we worry about things that will happen to us, things that haven't happened yet, things that may never happen. We go and create these worries because of selfishness. And then in the opposite way, selfishness goes and causes problems with the past. We go and feel we long for the past. We dwell in memories and get upset about the past. So selfishness can makes us both worry about the future and long for the past. Another one is envy. 
Selfishness envies the one who is is more intelligent or stronger or has more power or is more beautiful. Anybody who's got something more than us, we, we envy them. And this envy is tearing apart the world. It, it creates problems between families. Their envy over whose child is does better in school and things like that, or who makes more money. There's envy between communities, between villages, and the envy between countries is ripping the world apart. There's tremendous problems created by the envy which comes from selfishness. We see someone has more money than us and we become envious. Or they have a bigger house or a faster car or more beautiful clothes or even a, a better location in the meditation hall. And we become envious. And while we're sitting there being burned up and bitten by our envy, the other person doesn't know a thing is happening. We're creating all kinds of schemes to, to get even. And they don't, and they're not being affected in the least. This envy that comes from our selfishness bites us up. Doesn't, it bites individuals and then it can also function collectively between families, groups, and even nations. The last example we'd like to give is jealousy. When one is jealous of what one has, one doesn't want to share it. When one is jealous of one's possessions or whatever, one won't share it with others, even those who are in need. And there's a special kind of jealousy. In Thai, there's a different word for it. Hung which is sexual jealousy. It's the jealousy one feels towards one's husband or wife or one's sexual partner, one's lover, where one is very possessive, very jealous of whoever this may be. Both kinds of the ordinary jealousy and the sexual kind, they burn us, they bite us very strongly. These are two last examples, or one last example, of how selfishness bites its owner. All of these things come from selfishness. There's love, anger, hatred, fear, excitement, longing after the future, or worry about the future, longing after the past, envy, and jealousy. These are just a few of the examples of what selfishness does, of how selfishness bites its owner. All of these come from selfishness, but there are many others which you can see for yourself. Just pay attention to the world a bit, and you'll see how all these different things operate. And notice that all of them come from selfishness. The Buddhist art is to not have a self. If there's no self, one doesn't have a self, then where does the selfishness come from? There's nothing to be selfish about, and there's nothing for the selfishness to, to bite. If there's no self, Life doesn't have an owner to get bitten. This is the Buddhist approach. In the theistic religions, when there's a God, one gives oneself to God. Give oneself to God totally. And then selfishness is God's problem and you're, you're free of it. 
there's nothing more. <clears throat> and once you've given yourself to God, there's nothing left to be bit anymore. So there are these two approaches. One is to, to have no self, to let go of self totally. And then there is, there is no selfishness. Um, that's how we get rid of selfishness. The other approach is to give oneself to God, and then God will take care of the problem. For the time that remains, we'd like to spend a little bit more time <clears throat> examining how selfishness bites the one who is selfish. <clears throat> the selfishness causes what <clears throat> what we call defilement or kilesa. Defilement means something dirty, something that pollutes. And in this case, it pollutes, defiles, makes the mind dirty. Whenever there is selfishness, it causes defilement. There are many different forms of defilement. There's, for example, love, anger, hatred, fear, worry, jealousy, envy, excitement, boredom, restlessness, doubt, and on and on. Or traditionally we speak of just the basic three, greed, anger, and delusion. Whenever there is selfishness, defilement appears. This is happening just, this is happening most of the time but very few people are interested. Nobody pays any attention to it, so they, they pretend that it's not happening, but it's happening pretty much all the time. So you might want to remember this, that whenever there is some kind of selfishness, there will be defilement. And these defilements are the state of mind that is defiled or polluted. Another name for defilement is fire. These things are fires in the mind. They burn, scorch, bake the mind from within. So try to remember this word defilement or kilesa, that whenever there is selfishness, there will be defilement. Now when there is defilement, there occurs something else which is called anutsaya or tendencies or habits. When one defilement occurs, it starts to develop a habit. The more we, a certain defilement happens, the more it becomes habitual. You can test this out very easy. Go and get angry at someone and then you'll find that it's very easy to get angry at them again and again to the point where it becomes a habit. You just see them and you get angry. And then once you've developed the, the habit, it's very hard to break. So once there occur the defilements, then the first defilement starts something and the next one starts to build up a habit. So after the defilements, there are the, the tendencies, the, the, habit, the habitual defilements. There are many people who write letters or come and ask questions about anger. They complain that they, they hate to get angry, they hate being angry, but they just can't help it, they can't stop it. They, they complain that why, why is it that they can't stop this anger? And the reason is because they, they don't know about these tendencies, this habit, that without knowing it for many years, they've let themselves get angry. They've gotten angry carelessly until it, this, this habit built up and got bigger and bigger until the, there's this monstrous, habit, you could say in the substratum of the mind, somewhere deep down in the mind, they're, de they're built up this, this big habit. 
towards anger. And now the habit is so strong, they have no control over it. They don't like it anymore, they don't want it anymore, but they have no control over it because they let it reach this proportion. The third thing that happens is then that these, these tendencies, these habits build up. They build up pressure. It's like, it's like there's a big jar in the mind and then every time a defilement happens it, it gets deposited in this jar. And then the mind collects these deposits and it builds up and then it gets a pressure. Until the point if there's just a tiny hole in the jar, this pressure will shoot out, which is called asava, which means it, it flows back out. If you put enough junk into the jar, then at one point it will start to come out again. These are the asavas. If we carelessly allow these defilements to happen over and over again, then the tendencies build up. And when the pressure gets too much, then they, they start to come back out. The meaning of a holy man, a holy one, is in Buddhism very clear. It's someone in whom, in whom there is no defilement, no more of these tendencies, and no more of this flowing out of defilement. In a life that has cleaned up all this mess of defilements and, and defiled habits and defiled outbursts, this is the meaning of the Holy One or a holy man. Mm -hmm. We think that in other religions it must be fundamentally the same. That how can you call a person holy? They're still getting angry or still have greed and so on. And if there's one just gets rid of selfishness, then one can clean up the whole mess. So the Buddhist art of living is to lessen selfishness, decrease selfishness, and we decrease the defilements. The less selfishness there is, the less we collect and store up those habits. And when the less there is stored up, the less there is to erupt and burst out. So the art of living is to, to work at decreasing and eliminating selfishness in order to clean up the defilements, tendencies, and eruptions. The word defilement means something that is dirty, filthy, polluted. And all these aspects of defilement are definitely dirty and polluting. But once the defilements appear and play their game, there's more to them than just being dirty. They have other qualities as well. They are fires that burn and scorch the mind. They are burdens, they are heavy weights that, that push down on life, that make life burdensome and very painful. They are bonds, they are chains that lock one into a prison. They are like a slavery that denies one of all freedom. So there's more to the defilement than just being low and kind of dirty. They affect life in many different ways. So the, the purpose of, of the art of living is to be free of all this, to be totally liberated. So there's nothing defiling, burning, choking, enchaining, enslaving us anymore. 
selfishness is the the root cause is the cause of all these these things so the way to be free is just to be free of the self which is the the basis of selfishness when there's no self then there's nothing there's no selfishness and one is totally free of all these things the concept of i of me and the selfishness that comes from this these are a darkness or blindness in our lives when our lives exist in this darkness when we live blindly then we we can barely do anything right whatever we do is confused complicated the dhamma of buddhism is like a light that that clears up that darkness that gets rid of the the blindness the buddha the meaning of buddha is to wake up buddha is this light that wakes one up this waking up this light that wakes us up is is the buddha or is buddha in having this light so that one is no longer trapped in this darkness of of i mine and selfishness and then with what with this light with this clarity and freedom then one can live life without without mistakes without making problems for oneself and others so we feel that it's very correct of you to have come here in this way with the intention to to study investigate and practice dhamma the dhamma in in buddhism and we wish you the best success so even those of you who came here as tourists you can leave as pilgrims finally we'd like to thank you for being good listeners thank you for giving us your attention this will end today's talk